Well, if you were here last week, and if you weren't, if you were here for the previous year and a half, then we've caught you up on the book of Acts. We've been journeying through uh, back to back the Gospel of Luke and then through the book of Acts, uh, looking at what it looks like, uh, first learning what God looked like as he interacted with broken and hurting humanity, and then uh, what that church looked like uh, that Jesus sent on mission after his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to the Father. So we're going to be jumping into Acts chapter 19 this morning and covering the first half of Acts 19. And as we look at this, I just want you to be reminded that, um, that this is Paul's uh, third missionary journey that he's embarking on. Uh, you remember, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but in Acts 18, uh, we end with uh, Aquila and Priscilla uh, talking to a guy by the name of Apollos, who is there teaching in uh, Ephesus, and he is, uh, at first, he, he's teaching and he's competent, he's a great speaker, but there's just some things he's not clear on, he doesn't understand, he doesn't, he's never heard of the, the baptism of Christ, he's, he's only baptized in the John's baptism, and so we'll see some of that take effect here as we jump into Acts chapter 19. Uh, this is uh, quite a few years. These are decades into Paul's life and ministry. This will be Paul's last missionary journey. As we've journeyed through the book of Acts together, you'll see some times where uh, the language shifts from saying they to us. And that's when Luke is traveling with Paul and the rest of the group. And you'll notice in Acts 19 that Luke doesn't say that. And so it's interesting because Paul spends by far the longest time he spends in any city that he's traveling on his missionary journeys in Ephesus. He stays there for three years, three, three and a half years teaching in the synagogue and then in a hall that he rents, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, Paul spends a lot of time here, but Luke is pretty brief about some of the details he gives on some of the things because he wasn't traveling with them. So let's jump in this morning, Acts chapter 19, starting at verse 1. It says, And it happened, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. And he said to them, When did you receive the Holy Spirit? When you believed? He said, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No. We've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. There were about 12 men in all. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the word that you've given us. We're thankful for the eyewitness account of Luke in the book of Acts when he traveled with Paul and the account that was given to him by others as he wrote the rest of his uh, account of what happened in the early church. And God, we're thankful uh, that this history has been recorded for us, not merely for history's sake, but for uh, encouragement and for instruction about what it looks like to be God's people living on God's mission in God's world, God's way. And I just pray, Lord, that as we uh, continue to look through the book of Acts, that you instruct us specifically here at 1-7, what it looks like for us corporately and individually to live on the mission that you've entrusted to every believer, everywhere, at every time. And so, Lord, we just pray that today you would teach us, you would remind us uh, again that what we accomplish, what we do, we do in your power and in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have this interesting moment where Paul travels through the inland and he gets back to Ephesus. Paul had just come from Antioch and was traveling through some other places, checking on churches that he had planted before, comes back to Ephesus where he had found some favor before. Uh, people had listened to him in the synagogue. He had been treated more favorably in the synagogue there. He wasn't chased outside of the city and stoned and left for dead. So that was a win for Paul. And so he's back in Ephesus, a place where he's been shown some favor, some kindness. So I think he's looking forward to maybe some fruitful ministry. And he gets there and he runs in. Now, Ephesus is no small city. It's a pretty good sized city. And he runs into these 12 guys who are disciples. They're called their students. They're followers of a teaching, right? Whether it's Apollos, who remember back in chapter chapter 18, verses 19 through 21, we learned that these guys are in, in Ephesus. They're teaching, they're learning from Apollos. Apollos is teaching, but Apollos only has been baptized in John's baptism, meaning that he believed that John the Baptist was preparing a people to receive the Jewish Messiah. And Apollos was teaching from the scriptures about Jesus, but he hadn't been baptized yet in, in chapter 18. So Aquila and Priscilla come and they kind of, they correct 
Apollos. Now, Apollos apparently is a good speaker, which was highly valued uh, in the ancient world, especially in the uh, Ephesus area. And so he probably has some pretty high standing. He's garnered a following, we'll learn as we read through the rest of the scriptures. So it's interesting, number one, that we have a lesson to learn about the value, I think, of, number one, the humility of Apollos and the value that the early church placed on women speaking into the lives of people to correct doctrine, right? Like, like there's no way that he would accept it correct if he was just ser- simply a Greek. He would not have listened. But uh, Aquila and Priscilla come, they correct. He changes, uh, he, he receives what they're teaching him. He begins to teach differently, correct doctrine. And then he leaves and he goes to Corinth. Now, Paul comes into his absence, finds these 12 guys who don't even know that there's a Holy Spirit. They're not even familiar that there's a Holy Spirit. And so these guys were committed to a teaching and committed to following. They were, they were doing evangelism. They were teaching others. Uh, but they didn't even know that there was a Holy Spirit, much less uh, the one that the Holy Spirit would lead them to, namely Christ. So they had been baptized in John the Baptist. Now, what was John the Baptist's baptism? It was essentially saying, prepare yourself. God is going to send someone to rescue us. God's going to send his Messiah, the one that we've read about in the Old Testament. Prepare yourself. It's like when we say, prepare yourself for worship. Prepare your heart, your mind, for when we gather here, we're going to meet with God corporately. We're going to pray together. We're going to sing together. We're going to hear the word together. We're going to speak and pray with one another. And so as we say, Sunday morning before you come, prepare your hearts. That's what John was doing to a generation. He was preparing the people for the coming the teaching, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, who was the Savior, the Christ. And so these guys had never heard of that. They had just heard that John was preparing to people and they wanted to be prepared. And so he, Paul begins to teach them. So it's interesting that these guys are called disciples. They were. I mean, to be a disciple doesn't necessarily mean that you are a disciple of Jesus. It just means you are a disciple. I remember one time when I was pastoring uh, at a church a long time ago, uh, one of the guys in our church was telling me about how, how difficult he found it to, to be a teacher, to, uh, to, to make disciples, to, to teach someone what he had, what he had learned, right? To, th- this, this idea of making disciples, when I would say, and I say it every Sunday here, I've done it for a really long time uh, because it's the commission that Jesus has sent his church on, And I want to remind you weekly that as we go, when we end, I say, go and make disciples. That's not my charge. I'm not asking you to do something that Jesus hasn't asked us to do. And so in saying that, it's like, it felt like such a tall order, right? Like I make disciples, man. That feels like there's an an authority or a wisdom or an understanding that he didn't feel like he had. Well, um, over time, I did some work with him. He owned his own business, and uh, he asked me to come out and help him do some things. So I went out and I helped him, and uh, it was, uh, so he was, he, he was an electrician. He did some stuff where, like, he asked me to come out and, like, I'd, I'd run some conduit or pull some wire or get up on a grain silo, which was way too high for my liking, and pull just hundreds of pounds of wire up. And so, and he was telling me, he was teaching me how to, how to bend conduit and how to get a bunch of wire that seemed like it was too big to go through this, through the conduit that we had run, through the pipe that we had run. He taught me how to do that in a way that was effective and efficient, in a way that wouldn't cut the wire. He taught me how to do what he was an expert in. And so when I had done that for, I don't know, a few weeks with him, just helping him out, um, I said to him, hey, you know that you're a disciple maker, right? He's like, what do you mean? I said, listen, you, you say you don't know how to make disciples, and I say you do. Like, look at all these people that work for you, that you've trained, that you are an expert in what you do, and you've taught them to do what you do, not only to do what you do, but to do it like you do. To be a disciple of a teacher in the early first century, you would learn to, to pronounce words a certain way. If they had an interpretation of scripture, you would attribute that to them. For instance, if you were all my disciples in early first century Israel and uh, there was a teaching, you would say, Rabbi Charlie, which yeah, I haven't heard that, right? Well, actually, I did have a guy I used to coach football with said we got rabbi. But anyway, um, so uh, if you would call me Rabbi Charlie and you would say Rabbi Charlie always says go and make disciples at the end of service. And so when you did a Bible study, you would say go and make disciples. And if I were to have a habit of saying go and make disciples, you would say go make disciples, right? You would just say it like I say it, right? Even if it was a little quirky, you would do it because that's exactly, you wanted to be like your teacher. 
right? That was the, that was the end goal. And so what you have is uh, this guy who can teach people how to do all the stuff uh, on a job site and tell them how to do it exactly and safely, right? Like it was important. If you, if you, if you pulled wire and you nicked a wire and it's and like that could set a house on fire and burn it to the ground. You don't want that. So it matters. What you're doing is important. And I said, you know, what you do is important and it matters to you, right? Right. And so you're careful about what you teach other people, right? Right. You give them a little responsibility, right? Right. And once they get that right, you give them more, right? Right. And I go, you're making disciples, right? So just teach them, learn how to make disciples of Jesus, just like you're making disciples on the job site. So for instance, teach them how to pray. Well, how do you pray? Teach them how to pray like you pray. And hopefully that will encourage you to maybe pray more and be more, right? If, if, if the people that I'm investing in only pray as much as I do and I'm not praying much, that should convict me. Or let's say I'm investing in somebody else and I want to teach them the Bible, teach them how to study it like I study it. Do I know what I'm doing or am I just flipping it open and going, today we read this, right? Or am I just reading the same book over and over and over again because it's comfortable and I understand it? Or am I trying to stretch my understanding of the scripture and I'm teaching them how to use cross-reference and how to use uh, good commentary? Am I, am I doing that? Right? You're teaching them to do what you do. How do you do that? You do it with them. What about, what about sharing our faith? Like, that's a huge thing. That's, that can be really hard and really awkward and really intimidating. But what if, if I'm comfortable doing. What if I bring somebody with me and over coffee, I have, I sit down and I'm talking to somebody and they're with me and maybe they're throwing a little something, but maybe they're just observing how natural it is for me to share my faith. Or maybe it's just investing in the life of someone who doesn't yet know Jesus. And I bring someone else along with me so they can see what that looks like. It's just teaching people to do. And all of you, all of you are disciple makers of something right? If you ever have tutored somebody or helped somebody in class, if you're an athlete and you're teaching someone to do something a little bit better, then you are teaching that person to do what you do. And this is what happened here. Somebody was teaching them how to do what they did, but it was an incomplete understanding. I used to, I I just, a hundred miles an hour in the wrong direction will only get you lost faster. Does that make sense? One time I was at a concert for a band that, as I scan the room, the majority of you have probably never heard of, uh, Def Leppard, a uh, band that, like some of them, I don't know why that, you, you know them, right? So anyway, so I'm at a concert in uh, Alpine Valley, Wisconsin, and it rains, it's an outdoor venue, and it rains all day long, and we have, we have seats in the pavilion, and so I'm dry, right? We get to our seats, we're good to go, but then we climbed up the grass hill to get us out, which had turned into a gigantic mudslide, right? And so we're sliding down that, we get out to the parking lot, which was a mix of, I don't know, for the entire acres and acres and acres of parking, I would say that there were maybe 10 pieces of gravel, and the rest was mud and grass, right? And so we're in the grass, stuck in this thing, and we're getting ready to leave. It's about 1130 at night, and we just get stuck like everybody else. So we get out of this concert, probably 30, 2 o'clock in the morning. We are caked in mud. I'm pushing. My friend is in the car. Uh, like I'm, So I'm caked in the mud that the car is kicking up. I'm exhausted. I'm trying to push this thing out, trying to dig it out. We get in the car. We start driving. This is in Wisconsin. And I'm like, hey, man, uh, can you drive home? I just, I'm gassed. So I'm in the passenger seat and I'm sleeping. And uh, I don't know how long I'm out, but a few while later, I get an elbow. He says, hey, man, I go, what's up? He's like, hey, is, is Purdue in Indiana? And I go, yeah, why? He's like, there it is. I'm like, dude, where are we going? And I, they're like, we're like 16, 17 years old. We had no idea where we were at. And so I'm like, yeah. Up. I'm driving, right? And so what we did is we did, you know, 70 miles an hour in the wrong direction for a couple hours, and we were in the wrong state. Like, we weren't too far off, but far enough that, like, we are in the wrong state. And so I drove home. We ended up getting home about dawn, which was awesome. But yeah, and no cell phones, no GPS, just two dumb kids lost in the country in Indiana between Purdue and Illinois somehow. But anyway, we get home, but like, uh, uh, 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction only gets you more lost quicker, right? And so that's what's going on with these guys. They're... Have you ever heard the expression leaning your ladder against the wrong wall? Like you're working hard and you're climbing. It's always used in business. Like you're climbing the corporate ladder. What if you do that for 20, 30, 40 years and you realize you've had the ladder against the wrong building the whole time? You work so hard to get up to the top and you're in a place that you really don't want to be anyway. Right? 
What do you do if you're investing a lot of your time? You see, listen, zeal or commitment does not save you. Being really zealous or really committed to a false belief does not save you. These guys had an incomplete understanding of what it meant to have a relationship with God. They thought that they were disciples of John and thought they were in a good place, but they were lost. They did not know that Christ had died and, and purchased their salvation for them. And that only by trusting in him would they be able to know God. They had no idea that they were lost because they were zealous. They were committed. They were committed. They were disciples. They had an incomplete understanding. This is super duper common in our world. To have an incomplete understanding of who God is or what it means to know. Listen, how many times have you heard something like this? Listen, as long as I'm sincere in what I believe, I think God's okay with that. As long as I really believe what I believe, that's not true. What if, what if I believe that all roads ultimately lead to one? It doesn't matter if it's Christ or if it's Buddha, or if it's Hindu, or just fill it in. Fill in of the myriad, of uh, uh, the multitude of gods. Just pick one. They all lead to one. God is love. God's never going to call us to account. It was never going to be a judgment day. God just loves us, and then everybody, at the end of the day, is going to be just fine. Listen, I'm a good person. There's some people that are going to face judgment, but I'm not that guy. I'm not that girl. Like, I'm okay. Listen, I do a lot of things for God. I, I, I lead a small group. I teach a Bible study. I serve every week. I, I, I give. I'm generous. Like, all these things. Like, if that's what you're trusting in, if that's your hope, your ladder is on the wrong wall. Now, some of these things are good. Should you be serving? Should you be generous? Should you be teach, leading Bible studies? Should you be? Yes. Is that going to save you? There's no chance. There's no chance that God goes, oh, because you've served at the Salvation Army every week for the last 50 years, you're good. It doesn't atone for your sin. If, if you're trusting in the fact that you really are zealous about what you believe, but your faith and your hope isn't placed squarely on Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It's not going to save you. If you say, I'm a good person, well, that's a conversation we can have for a really long time. Like, that's a sliding scale. Who determines that? And good compared to who? Because there's someone better than you that thinks you're not a good one. So you've got these people that Paul comes into contact with, and they don't know that they don't know that they don't know that they're lost. And Paul comes in and preaches the simple gospel to them. Do you know what this is? This is, a, these, this is a Christless Christianity. Like, they think that they're following God, but they don't need Jesus. And we'll get into this a little bit more at the end of this chapter, or at the end of the section today, but I fear that it's one of the, the biggest hurdles of the church in the West is a Christless Christianity. This idea that we can love and follow God without really knowing or loving or having a desire to know Jesus at all. It becomes about what we do and what we give some sort of mental assent to, but it doesn't transform us. So, uh, Paul preaches to them, lays hands on them, they receive the Holy Spirit, and their lives are transformed. Then in verse 8 it says, He entered the synagogue, for, and for three months he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn, Speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them, and he took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannius. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So, so those who had listened graciously, graciously to Paul in Acts 18, verses 19 through, I think, 21, like, they've had enough. We've heard it. Uh, you're, we're done, Paul. And they started speaking maliciously of the way. Remember, uh, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. He called them, the disciples called themselves followers of the way. And so uh, you've got these believers in the synagogue that go with Paul. Paul leaves. He rents a hall next door to the synagogue, down the street, downtown, somewhere. Uh, he finds a way. He finds a way. And so, so some of you, I just want... I've wrestled with this. I've had this happen in my own life. And so there may be, maybe not, but there might be someone in this room that really feels like God has called you to a specific work, 
to serve this particular group or to do ministry in this particular setting. And as you start to do that, it doesn't go particularly well. And you go, man, this is really hard. There's a lot of roadblocks, and this isn't as easy as I thought. And, and the people that I thought were going to come with me to help are not. And the people that I thought were going to be receptive are not. And this is really hard. I just want to, don't give up. Find a way. Look for a way. Look for a way to continue to live out that calling. Like for some of us, when we go, hey, I feel like God is, is calling me to go do this thing or to work in this place. And then we get there, and it looks nothing like we envisioned it. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. We have this, this idea of what life is going to look like if you follow Jesus faithfully. Right? For some of you who are really young, maybe that was in junior high or high school, you committed your life to Christ, and you had an idea of what that was going to look like as your life unfolded, and now you're going, nothing adds up. Like, it doesn't look anything like it. I thought I was going to be serving God here, and now there's... Here. Listen, when God calls us to a work... It never looks like, we ima- or like what we imagine God wants us to do because he's called us there to do the work of transformation, right? If God has called you to start this Bible study and you have this idea of like sitting in a room full of people, like you have this desire, this urge to get people in a room and study the Bible and your vision is all these people are going, this is wonderful. I've never heard any of this. I'm so up and I'm growing so I'm just unbelievably. This is, can I invite more people? And then you invite some people and nobody shows up and you've got uh, chips and dip and cookies set out and no one showed up and you just have a lot of chips and dip for yourself. You think, I'll do it next week. And you do it next week and, and one person shows up and you're, they're like, where is everybody? And you're like, we are everybody. And you're like, man, this is not at all what I envisioned. I had envisioned this room full of people. Keep going. Keep going because maybe in a year, maybe in five years, maybe in 20 years, maybe in zero years, maybe it will never happen. But what God has called us to is the journey of obedience to follow him, long obedience in the same direction. There's a pastor who uh, was going to uh, a seminary in Deerfield here in Illinois, not too far from here. And when he was in seminary, he was going to plant a church. And he got a group of people together, and they were going to plant a church. And so you got to be strategically ready when you plant a church. And so they had a 25-year plan. 25-year plan. Like, imagine that. I don't, know, I don't know what 25 days look like for most of us. Minutes? 25 minutes? 25-year plan. They put, he put some work in this thing. That's like a multi-volume set of plans for your future. They never had a service. Never launched. Never worked. Disappointed. Discouraged. We're wondering why in the world God would lay this thing on his heart to do this thing. He was convinced it's something God had asked him to do. But gradually, he applies for some other work. He takes a job at a, at a nonprofit, a parachurch organization uh, in D.C. And he goes out there and starts to work out there. And then while he's out there, he uh, starts a Bible study. And christian or two shows up and then a bunch of people who don't know jesus start to show up and more and more start to show up and now they've got this room full of people then a house full of people then a couple houses full of people and then they plant a church there and then that church gets too full so they plant another church and so then another church and then another church and there's a train system out there and they've planted their, their goal is to plant a church at every stop along the train station out there and then he had a 25 year failed plan and out of that god directs him someplace else and then the experience the plan that he had in place is coming to, in, in just a different setting right so just keep being obedient the next step that's what paul does paul says i meet in the synagogue it's going well all of a sudden it's not going well guess i'm going to go down here to tyranius's hall and rent that so he didn't let outside circumstances stop the work of god in his life and in the community in ephesus so then in acts uh, in verse 11 God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. This is, by the way, not prescriptive. This does not mean that you take some bandanas, pray over them, and send them out with your friends to go heal the people in the hospital. Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, this is a thing, by the way, that there were Jewish itinerant, which means they traveled, think traveling evangelist, right? They were traveling around, they were Jewish itinerant exorcists to cast out demons. 
And so they undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you or command you by, by Jesus who Paul proclaims. I want you to imagine this for a second. In Ephesus, where like black magic and like think voodoo type, like that kind of stuff, really popular in Ephesus. Really large market. And you've got these Jewish itinerant demon caster outers, and they're showing up, and they're using the name of Jesus. So what you've got is these people who believe in magic incantation, magic spells, magic potions, and in that setting, they go, oh yeah, well watch this. Paul takes a handkerchief, sends it to the sick, and they're healed. They're like, oh, okay. So they go, well, maybe let's give Paul a listen to see what's going on. Now these Jewish itinerant exorcists hear what Paul is doing, and they start going around going, that seems to work for Paul. So we're going to say, hey, we command you by Jesus' name whom Paul preaches. They have no idea who Jesus is, but they're going to use that name because they've seen it work. Now we would never do that, right? We'd never do that. Except for those times that you and I will pray and ask for things that we know are not God's will for our life. But if we add in Jesus' name at the end of a prayer. By the way, when Jesus said, when you ask things in my name, he was not giving you a formula for prayer. Right? We say in Jesus' name, but what he's really saying when he tells us to pray in his name means according to his will, for his purpose, and ultimately and chiefly for his glory. That's what it means to ask in Jesus' name. It doesn't mean if you say, if Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll give it to you. Jesus, I'd like to win the lottery in your name. He's not a magic lamp. Jesus is not a lucky rabbit's foot, but we treat him so often like that. And so that's what these Jewish sorcerers or exorcists are doing. They say, we're going to use Jesus' name. So, I command you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches, seven sons of a Jewish high priest, whoops, sorry, uh, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? Whoa. So, uh, a few years back, uh, we took a trip uh, down to the Dominican, and we were uh, serving there, the Dominican, for a while. And then there was one day where uh, Caleb, one of our elders, and I went with the leader of the ministry there into Haiti and uh, to do kind of an exploratory trip to see the work that they were doing there in Haiti. And we got into Haiti, and it was day and night, man. It's like, if I, like, as I remember, like, the Dominican was very green and beautiful, and then you get into the border, and it feels like it was just, like, scorched earth. It was like Haiti was just dead. It was like you could feel, it just, it's heavy. So we're going through, and our guide is taking us through some areas. He took us out to this place where, uh, I'm pretty sure some of these kids had never seen a, uh, a I don't know, a white bald guy, because I got out of the van, do you remember that? And I was putting lotion on my head, and that was the funniest thing they had ever seen in their entire life, bar none. So that does good for the self-esteem. Travel halfway around the world to have a village of small children laugh at you. So, and then there was this, uh, and I'm just telling the story, sorry, at this point, but like, there was a pig, a local pig in the community that ate, like, just eat random garbage or I don't know, horses? This thing was gigantic. It was like, if you ever seen an old VW bug, it had to be that big. And this thing is laying down sleeping, and it's like this tall, right? It's this gigantic dinosaur pig. And, and I'm like, I've got to get my picture taken with this thing, right? And so it's behind me, and so I'm like, Caleb, here's my phone, take my picture. And so I'm standing in front of this pig, and he goes like this. And, I, and so I take off running. He's like, I'm just kidding. The thing wasn't moving at all, but it would, it would eat me. That was just from, I don't know. I thought it was funny. Anyway, so we're in Haiti. We go through, I'll see all these things. And then um, our guide is telling us about how some of the, the, the witch doctors in Haiti had taken over some of the Catholic churches that had been abandoned. And uh, the stations of the cross that were in a stained glass window, they had transformed them to make them different uh, parts of uh, voodoo rites. And they would do these rituals and these rites in these churches. And so he was telling us about just, I think it was a week or two before we were there, on a Friday night, uh, they were downtown in a big city in Haiti there, and uh, they had gathered all these people, and the witch doctor was doing some sort of spell, incantation thing. And there are, there are hundreds, if not a thousand people gathered in this town square while this witch doctor is doing this ritual sacrifice. 
And this pastor and the guy that we were with, we weren't there at the time, but the guy, our guide was telling us that he was there with another pastor. And while they were there, this witch doctor is doing whatever he's doing, and he stops abruptly. Looks around, scans the crowd, locks eyes with the pastor, who had never been there before, and goes, what are you doing here? To which he's like, ah. you know what I love about that? I, I, don't, I don't have any idea how that story ends. That's the last thing I know about that story. I don't know if they told me the end of it and I've forgotten it, but I really make that, that, to me, that makes me feel like in the prodigal son, when Jesus doesn't wrap up the story, I kind of put myself in that pastor's shoes and say, what would I do in a situation that's straight out of the book of Acts where somebody does that? So here's what you have. You have these guys, uh, the evil spirit answers them, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit, he, le he leaped on them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. This is, this is amazing. You've got, you've got this guy who's possessed and you have these exorcists to go in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches come out and the demon says we've heard of Paul we know Jesus who in the world are you and here's what you have going back to the beginning of this cha chapter you have people trying to live a Christian life without Christ they're trying to do the work of Jesus without Jesus and none of us would ever say that that's our intention I just wonder if sometimes we wouldn't live out practically what, what one pastor calls Christian atheism. Like, we believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus here, but we live most of our life as if we've got it all on our own. Right? Like, how much, how, how dependent upon you, how dependent upon Jesus are you in your everyday life? Or do you think, Jesus is a nice addition to my life, that he makes my life makes sense and it makes it good and he gives me hope in the broken times but are you dependent on him like are you are you hungry for him like do you want to know him above everything else and when you serve are you serving out of the overflow of what god is doing in your life or is jesus just an add-on in your life i'm a student i work here i do this thing i'm dating so-and-so i'm married to so-and-so i've got so many kids or whatever it is oh and also I'm a Christian. Or does, does Jesus touch every area of your life and inform how you live in that area? you got people here who don't know Jesus at all trying to do ministry in his name. And there's some of us who know Jesus minimally and wonder why our lives aren't transformed more, why our lives are a wreck, why we don't have peace, or why the ministry we're attempting to do isn't effective. And I wonder if it's not because, if it isn't because, rather, that we just... We're trying to do it in our own power, in our own strength. Sometimes, some of the best advice I've ever heard, it wasn't given to me, it was just given in general by a pastor who said this, never love your ministry more than your Savior. And sometimes I think it's easier to, it's easy to get into a thing of like loving our Christian life more than we love Jesus himself. We love the community. We love serving with other people because we love the joy that that brings, helping others or serving with someone else at the expense of spending time with our Savior. Like, do you know him? Do you, is, is that your chief goal, to know Jesus? Not do stuff for him? Not to just know about him? Do you know him? So, they see what happens. These guys get beat up. They're bloody and naked. That'll get the community talking, right? So they leave after that, and it says that fear fell on everybody in Ephesus. Now listen to what happens here. Many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. A number of those had practiced magic arts, brought their books together, and burned them inside of, it all, of, the, of all. They counted the value of them, and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. The word of the Lord continued to increase, increase rather, and prevail mightily. What I love about this is that 
Like all the knowledge that maybe these people had had or all the things they had heard never transformed them. But an encounter with the living Christ, when they hear and, and believe and trust in Jesus, their life is transformed. They see the power of God at work in the world and they say, we don't want to live like that anymore. And so they come in at great expense to themselves. This money they invested, they had burned. And so for some of you, you guys are in relationships that don't honor God, but you feel like, I've committed this much time, I don't want to step out of that relationship now. I've invested so much time. It's not honoring to God or your Savior. Some of you are, uh, have, have sinful habits or practices, and if we're just being honest, our appetite for those things are stronger than our appetite for Jesus. He's called us to lay those things down and to find new life and a lighter burden in himself. I want to ask you this morning, if you would call yourself a Christian in this room this morning, like, do you, this is a word that I think we don't, I don't know, I, I, we don't use often enough for whatever reason. Like, do you delight, do you have real joy in just spending time with him? Like, I, I hope that you do. I hope it's not enough just to attend church or maybe attend a Christian university or be a part of a small group or a Bible study, or even lead a ministry. I hope those, those things are all woefully insufficient and unsatisfying compared to knowing Jesus. I hope that it's a joy for you just to get alone and to pray today sometime. Maybe it's when you put your head on your pillow. Maybe it's riding in your car, listening to some worship music, and just you spending some time alone worshiping the king of the universe. Like, have you been trying to live the Christian life without Jesus? Like, do you think you're sufficient? Like, you would never say that, right? But like, what's your prayer life been like? What's your, what's your study of the scripture look like? And I would just argue that if those things are, are pretty dormant or dead in our life, that we could, we could say that we're following Jesus, but like, this is evidence. This, again, this doesn't save you. This doesn't make you a Christian. It's evidence that you love him. And I just want to, I guess as I wanted to, to jump back into Acts today, this is a perfect place to do it, to jump in to say, let's make a cut with who we used to be. And let's trust Christ, not only with our eternity, but with our daily lives. And I hope that we pursue him. And so this morning, I want to take some time, and we're going to have James come back up and just play a little bit. Uh, before we take the Lord's Supper together, I want you just to spend some time, like, praying. Paul says that before we take the Lord's Supper, we should examine ourselves to see whether or not we be in Christ. Some of you maybe would have called yourself a Christian, but you've never actually trusted Christ. You've never said, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I, I need you to forgive me of my sins, and my only hope in eternity is you. It's not that I'm a good person. It's not that I've done all the right things. Like, all those things, God, the only hope that I have is you, Jesus. Or maybe it's been a while since you spent any time with him. And, or maybe there's just something, if we're really being honest, if you got quiet before the Lord, you go, man, I know there's this thing that's between me and God, and I need to get it right. Would you in this, just in this moment, while we kind of bow our heads and let James play, would you pray? And whatever it is, maybe you just need to say thank you for being reminded that Christ died in your place, and that's our only hope.